Just a heads up, I did something very silly a couple days ago. I bit my tongue really, really bad, and it's very swollen and it hurts a lot. But I need to film this video today and we're just going to power through it. But if I sound a little weird, that's why. <laughs> Hello everyone, I am Sammy, your devoted manga otaku, and welcome to my manga space. Today, I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in June, July, and August. And I wanted to be real with you guys for a second here. I had every intention of filming a wrap up at the end of July, like I promised, but after releasing my reading vlog video, which was essentially a wrap up video, <laughs> I just didn't have the energy to write more reviews. My wrap-up videos are the hardest videos for me to make. I spend a lot of time on them, but they are some of my proudest videos. So I really strive to make them decent. And in the end, I'm really happy that I waited. Now, like I said before, I read a whack of books for my reading vlog, all of which were picked up by my best friend Jordaline, and she picked some real winners. Since I've already shared my thoughts, I'll just be mentioning those books very briefly, but if you want some more details, you are welcome to check out that vlog. I'll make sure to leave a card on the screen and link in the description below. And with that, I invite you to grab a coffee or other beverage of your choice, and let's talk manga. The first manga that I'm going to be quickly mentioning is Volume 1 of Dragon Ball, the 3-in-1 edition by Akira Toriyama. I read this in my reading vlog, and I wasn't a huge fan. It's a lot more perverted than I initially thought, and a scene depicting an attempted sexual assault made me very uncomfortable. I like the world building, I like the adventure, and I enjoy the quest these characters are embarking on, but I'm looking forward to future volumes where the toilet humor and constant sexual harassment is toned down. I gave this volume two and a half stars, which is quite low, but I'm confident my rating will go up as I read more volumes. Next up, we have another book that I reviewed in my reading vlog, and that was volume one of Kaiju Girl Caramelise, and this is by Spica Aoki. This was an insanely cute rom-com story following a high schooler named Kuroe, who turns into a giant kaiju when she gets too emotional. For such an odd premise, I think that this manga works really well. I like the characters, and I can tell Kuroe's sudden transformations are going to be a great catalyst for comedy. I think the romance is kind of tropey, and I'm still unsure of what the story will become long term, but it's mysterious and unique. Furthermore, I thought that the art was very sparkly and fluffy, and I love Kuroe's Godzilla-esque kaiju design. One thing that I forgot to mention in my reading vlog was the afterword. Apparently, the series was published in a seinen magazine, so Aoki Sensei wrote it as a seinen, even though she considers herself a shoujo writer. Her publishers asked her to rewrite the manga as a shoujo. So even though this is technically seinen, the mangaka categorizes it as a shoujo series. I don't know about you, but I love learning these neat little bits of information. <laughs> Overall, I gave this volume three and a half stars and I recommend it to both shoujo and kaiju or monster lovers. And then we have to discuss volumes five and six of Sailor Moon the Eternal Editions, and these are by Na Kotaka Uchi. Reading 5 and 6 back to back was a really awesome experience. Volume 5 ends in a cliffhanger, so I was thankful that I got to pick up Volume 6 right away. Both these volumes cover the Deathbusters arc, which is the strongest arc so far in my opinion. I felt like the stakes were higher, and I enjoyed the complexity of the outer Sailor Senshi and how their duties and powers were vastly different from the inner Senshi. I really enjoyed the introductions of Sailor Uranus and Neptune. I knew a few things about their characters going into this, like how they were depicted as cousins in the old English dub. 
It seems so long ago, my first kiss. Not for me, Amara. Huh? It feels like, like it was yesterday. It was so magical. <gasps> oh. I remember it vividly. It was with Brad, the cutest guy in the school. love how the higher-ups thought Uranus and Neptune being lesbians was too risque for Western audiences, so they censored it and made them cousins. But that just made them look like incestuous cousins, which is not great. Kind of backfired. <laughs> Seeing the original material was wonderful, and I love the interactions between Sailor Moon and Sailor Uranus. I can't say too much because of spoilers, but if you know, you know. <laughs> now, I was surprised to see Sailor Uranus presenting as either a man or a woman, depending on the scene, and they use the pronouns to match. I was under the impression that they were just a tomboy but I've been enlightened. It's never confirmed, but I believe Sailor Uranus is probably non-binary or gender fluid. Seeing a lesbian relationship and a genderqueer character in the series was impressive. I just love how progressive Sailor Moon was for its time. Some other highlights in these volumes, we get to see Sailor Saturn's Awakening, which was highly anticipated, and I thought her role in the story was very interesting. We also get to see Super Sailor Moon, or Super Saiyan Sailor Moon as I like to call it. Lastly, we get to see the characters becoming more emotionally mature in these books, including Chibiusa and Usagi, who are starting to get along, which is refreshing. Overall, the ending to the Deathbusters arc was kind of bittersweet, and I'm hoping certain characters end up returning in future volumes. I feel like I'm slurring my words a lot. I'm really sorry if it sounds super weird. <laughs> Additionally, I finally know who this character is. I've seen their picture before, but I never knew who they were and you find out in this volume, and honestly, my mind is like completely blown. <laughs> now, before I wrap this up, I want to show you some of the art in here. I thought that the colored spreads in this installment were spectacular, as a lot of them feature all of the Sailor Senshi. So we've got this one, which is super cute. I love the pink and black. And then this spread is also very pretty. I just love seeing them all together. It's so satisfying. <laughs> In conclusion, both these books earned four stars from me, and reading Sailor Moon continues to be an enjoyable and nostalgic experience. In September, I plan on reading volume two of Codename Sailor V in addition to the seventh volume, and I'm really looking forward to checking them both out. Up next, we're going to quickly talk about another series that I read in my vlog, and that's the 20th anniversary edition of Paradise Kiss by Ayazawa. Paradise Kiss centers around a high school girl named Yukari who starts modeling for a group of fashion students entering in a school competition, and she quickly realizes that she enjoys this lifestyle more than her academic one. I had some mixed feelings about the series. It touches on some really important themes like following your dreams and finding inner strength, but it's also problematic at times as it contains a few transphobic and biphobic jokes and there's a romantic relationship born from sexual violence. Overall though, I enjoyed the series and appreciated its realistic and well-developed characters. The illustrations and fashion designs are exquisite, and the ending was appropriately bittersweet. I ended up giving this series four stars, and I recommend it to people who enjoy mature coming-of-age stories and fashion. Now, this next manga is one that I read all the way back in June, and that's volumes 1 through 8 of the Shonen series Blue Flag by Keito. I had been wanting to read this Shonen series for over a year, 
but I couldn't because I was struggling to find all of the volumes. I was over the moon when I finally found the rest of the manga and reading it was a long-awaited and pleasant experience. Also, I ended up reading it with Jordaline and it was my first time completing a buddy read with somebody. It was a lot of fun. Now, at a glance, Blue Flag looks like a romance and although relationships play a big part, I'd say this is closer to a coming of age story. It follows four teenagers in their last year of high school. You have Toma and Taiichi, two boys who were best friends growing up but slowly drifted apart as they got older. And then you have their classmates, Futuba and Masumi, who are extremely close friends. One day, the timid and shy Futuba asks Taiichi to help her confess her feelings to Toma because she struggles to speak to him without getting extremely nervous. Taiichi agrees to help Futuba despite secretly thinking that her plan will fail because he suspects that Toma likes someone else. From here, you end up following these characters as they navigate their senior year, embarking on a journey of self-discovery, finding first love, and learning the value of friendship. I thought Blue Flag was a very heartfelt and raw manga. In the first volume, it briefly comes off as a simple and cliche love triangle or love quadrangle, but quickly realize that this series is special. The books explore complex relationships and topics, and characters have nuanced discussions surrounding identity, sexuality, gender, love, and friendship. I truly believe these discussions and interactions have the potential to help people, specifically young people, figure out their own feelings. You even observe multiple viewpoints and perspectives, which is valuable. Additionally, I think what makes this series feel so different is the characters and how they feel like real people. They make choices that impact their lives and they develop with every decision made. They're insecure about their feelings and their future and their identity and seeing characters struggle with these relatable and realistic issues makes them feel authentic. I loved most of the lead and supporting characters. They were all well-crafted and three-dimensional, and I found myself wanting the best for each of them. Although I related to Taiichi the most, since I'm also a nerdy loner, <laughs> I'd have to say that my favorite character is definitely Toma. He's captain of the baseball team. He's athletic and handsome and popular, but he's also very sweet and silly. <laughs> I was emotionally invested in his story and his expressions easily brought tears to my eyes. Besides Toma, my next favorite character would probably be Mami. Even though she's just in a supporting role, I found her character quite complex. At first, Mami is painted to be this mean and jealous girl, but slowly you discover that there's way more to her than that, and it transformed how I saw her character. Lastly, I have to quickly mention my love for Toma's brother and his sister-in-law. I adored those characters and thought they deserved a shout out. One thing that I thought was both a strength and a weakness in this manga was the communication. Keito Sensei explained in the afterword of the last volume that they wanted to write a manga where characters are honest and talk to each other because they dislike poor communication and misunderstandings in manga. And I believe that they achieved that with this. However, there were a couple times where the dialogue was soapbox preachy and it felt like a lecture versus being organic. I found myself reading these long-winded conversations as fast as possible just so that I could get to the next part of the story. Now, I know the conclusion has been a little controversial in the manga community. 
specifically the seven year time jump at the end. There were parts that I really loved about the ending and parts that I felt could have been executed better. Because of the fast forward in time, we don't get to see the characters develop and grow over those seven years. And in the future, some characters feel very different and it's a bit jarring. Masumi's character was a great example of this. I felt like she had been largely overlooked by the end and some things about her character are never explained or clarified. It's just really vague. I wish we could have gotten an entire volume dedicated to a post high school arc so we could see what happened in those seven years versus the basic summary that we got. Maybe the ending wouldn't have felt so rushed. I think I understand what Kato Sensei was trying to do. They were trying to express that the choices you make in high school do not define your whole life. The future is uncertain and people change. But like I said earlier, I think this could have been executed way better. With all that said, I will admit that I cried like a baby at the end. I was taken aback by a certain fact. I don't want to spoil it for anyone but it made me really happy. <laughs> I thought the art style was amazing. You can tell it's a shonen just by how the characters are designed and drawn. Everyone looks very unique and it was refreshing to see so many different character designs. Also, I think my favorite moments in this series were ones where there was like little to no dialogue because Keito Sensei is skilled at conveying atmosphere and emotion through the visuals. It's very beautiful and emotional. Despite my issues with the ending, I think this is a very worthwhile middle-length series with mature discussions and themes. I was emotionally invested in both the characters and the storyline, and I thought that LGBTQ plus representation was pretty good. I think I'm going to rate this series four stars, maybe four and a half stars. I'm still undecided, but now that it's fully back in stock, I recommend that you check it out. I have to take off my sweater because I'm literally dying. <laughs> Whew, so much better. <laughs> So the next manga that I want to talk about is another book that I reviewed in my reading vlog and that's volume 1 of If I Could Reach You by TMNR. This is an unrequited love story following a high schooler named Yuta who is in love with her sister-in-law. What's worse is that she has to live with the newlyweds and Yuta is finding it hard to move on while living with the object of her affection. I thought that this volume was a solid and fascinating start to the series. We're introduced to all of the characters who all seem pretty likable and endearing, except for Yuta's brother. He's acting suspicious and I have an overall bad vibe about him. <laughs> I think that the artwork is well drawn, it has a very soft look to it, and it's very detailed. I'm very intrigued about where this manga will go because it could just continue to be a one-sided love story, or it could become something more scandalous. I'm excited to continue and let you guys know what I think. The next manga is one that was very heavy and uncomfortable to read and that's volumes one through three of Sensei, Sensei's Pious Lie by Akane Torikai and these are the two-in-one editions. Also, can I just say that all my life I've pronounced the name Akane, I've pronounced it Akane, only recently did I learn that it's pronounced Akane, so the more you know. <laughs> now, I have quite a few hard to digest titles in my collection. Titles like Life and Confidential Confessions, but this series is on a whole other level, especially when it comes to depicting realistic instances of sexual violence. So with that said, before getting into this review, I want to warn anyone that's sensitive towards any type of sexual and psychological abuse. I won't be getting into the nitty gritty details of this series, but I will be mentioning problematic situations and behaviors that happen in this manga. So if you'd rather skip ahead, I urge you to use those timestamps. 
So the narrative of Sensei's Pious Lie centers around a single 24-year-old high school teacher named Misuzu Hara. Misuzu is a reserved person. She's content spending her days quietly judging her students and their social lives, but she's secretly in turmoil. Four years ago, her best friend's boyfriend and now fiance raped her and is using coercion to force her into continuing a secret, non-consensual relationship with him. Continually living with this trauma and guilt has severely impacted Miss Suzu's outlook on gender. She truly believes that women exist only to be defiled by men. So when a 16 year old boy named Nizuma claims to have been sexually assaulted by an older woman and asks his teacher, Misuzu, for advice and guidance, she rebukes his experience because of his gender. Nizuma firmly disagrees with Misuzu in this conversation as he believes both men and women are equal and it's this exchange that sparks intense feelings and a growing chemistry between student and teacher. <sighs> I'm not really sure where to start with this series. It's definitely not enjoyable in any way, but it's undeniably well-written, thought-provoking, and direct in what it's trying to communicate. I found the pacing mentally exhausting. The character's trauma is constantly being thrown at you, and with every volume, things just keep getting worse. There are some very serious topics discussed and depicted in the series. Rape, blackmail, incest, coercion, bullying, body shaming, gender bias, unhealthy power dynamics, and inappropriate relationships. It's all laid bare and is never sugarcoated. Additionally, the manga dives into the psyche of victims of abuse. You see how people react to sexual assault and trauma differently, how victims can feel disgust and guilt when it comes to their abuser, but also how they can be enamored by them. The characters are all pretty unlikable and flawed with very few redeeming qualities, and I don't see happy endings for any of them. I do hope justice is served when it comes to the serial rapist though, because He's a vile and disgusting monster, and if he doesn't experience any repercussions by the end of the story, I will rage. <laughs> As for the visuals, I think that they are extremely raw and expressive. They remind me a lot of Shuzo Oshimi's illustrations. The scenes of sexual assault were depicted honestly and never glamorized. I actually found them kind of frightening because Torakai Sensei captures emotions of terror and disgust on the characters' faces. I did feel like the third volume was the weakest so far because I felt like it moved away from the realism and started treading into soap opera territory. I'm rating the first two volumes five stars and then dropping it to four stars for volume three. I hope that the finale steers clear of unrealistic drama as I like this manga for its accurate portrayal of abuse and trauma. Obviously, this manga won't be for everyone, but if you like dark titles with mature and uncomfortable themes, you might want to look into this one. Also, I want to give a quick shout out to Meet the Weave family. Mom and Dad Weave recently discussed the first two volumes of Sensei's Pious Lie on their channel, and it was really interesting to hear their thoughts and experiences with the story. I'll leave a card on the screen and link in the description if you want to check it out. The rest of the manga I read were all rated five stars, and I'm super excited to gush about them. We're going to start with Go With The Clouds North by Northwest, and this is by Aki Irie. And this is also the same mangaka who wrote Ran and the Grey World, which I haven't read but heard pretty good things about. I talked about volume one in my reading vlog, but I've now read up to volume five, and I want to share my thoughts on those later volumes. The narrative follows a 17-year-old boy named Kai, who lives with his grandfather in Iceland. Kai works as a private investigator, 
and uses his supernatural ability to talk to machines and technology in order to solve mysteries for people. However, Kai will have to use his detective skills to solve a mystery a little closer to home. After learning that his aunt and uncle have passed away suddenly and his little brother is currently missing. After reading volume one, I was immediately obsessed. <laughs> the hook at the end just grabbed me and I had to find out what happens next. Volume two was a strange follow-up to the first installment as it centers around Kai's childhood friend Kiyoshi visiting him from Japan and Kai essentially taking him on a tour guide through Iceland. I suspect a lot of readers will find this detour a bit jarring as it focuses on the beauty and geology of Iceland and learning more about the characters versus the mystery from the first volume. I quite enjoyed it though. I thought it was very informative and the illustrations of Iceland's scenery and landscapes was breathtaking. Volumes three through five dive back into the mystery and intrigue, but the plot does continue to jump around with the focus shifting between different characters and plot points. I actually enjoyed the story being told this way. It feels dreamlike and I love how the little vignettes help flesh out the story and the characters. Also, I was surprised by the borderline horror elements of this series. I know it's categorized as a thriller, but it's kind of scary. Well, maybe scary is the wrong word to use. I'm not sure. I don't want to spoil anything for anyone, but it gets pretty creepy. <laughs> As for the characters, I've really grown attached to them and I adore the romance blossoming between Kai and Lil Lilia, I think is how you pronounce it. Volume 5 really focuses on their relationship and I couldn't help but smile at all the sweet and wholesome moments between them. The artwork is a feast for the eyes. Everything is illustrated with care and the attention to detail is impeccable. If you enjoy slice of life stories with mystery and magical realism elements, I think you'd really enjoy this series. I'm very sad that the release date for volume six is set for September, 2023. That'll put two years between volumes five and six, which is a pretty huge gap. Nevertheless, I will be pre-ordering closer to its release. Okay, and now I wanna talk about one of my new favorite romances. I read volumes one through five of My Dress Up Darling by Shinichi Fukuda for my reading vlog and I had so much fun with this series. Basically, the manga follows a quiet and introverted boy named Gojo who's been practicing doll artistry for years in the hopes of becoming a professional Hina doll maker. After Marin, a very loud and popular classmate of Gojo's, discovers he's skilled at sewing, she begs him to help her make the cosplay outfit of her dreams. This is one of the cutest light ecchi manga I've ever read. It's funny and the characters are really lovable. Not only do you get to witness the adorable relationship blossoming between the leads, you also get to learn many useful and interesting facts about cosplay. Since my blog review, I read the newly released sixth volume and I really liked it. Marin and Gojo meet a new cosplayer who may or may not be a reoccurring character, but the duo learns this person's troubles with cosplay and Gojo ends up relating to this person's struggle. It was a very eye-opening volume for Gojo, I think. The volume ended on a cliffhanger, so I'm really excited to see what happens next. One downfall for a lot of romance series, in my opinion, is making readers wait for a confession. Personally, I find dragged out confessions annoying, especially when the characters like each other. I'm really hoping My Dress Up Darling doesn't fall prey to this and the leads communicate their feelings soon. This series easily gets five stars from me. I actually convinced my husband to watch the anime with me and we both found it very entertaining and hilarious. I recommend people check out both the manga and the anime. 
Now, I really wanted to end this wrap up on a adorable note. So I'm going to quickly talk about A Man and His Cat by Umi Sukurai, which is another series that I talked about in my vlog. This is a wonderfully illustrated and wholesome story about a middle-aged man who adopts a cat because he's recently widowed and craves companionship. What follows is an adorable and heartwarming story about a man and his cat learning to trust and love each other. It also shares meaningful messages such as the importance of being vulnerable and allowing yourself to lean on others. This series comes highly recommended from me and although cat lovers might relate to the cat antics more, I feel like most people would enjoy this cute slice of life manga. And that's everything that I read recently. It feels amazing to finally be caught up in sharing my thoughts with you guys and I hope that now school is back in session, I can get back to my regular monthly wrap ups. I'd love to know what you guys have been reading lately, so make sure to let me know in the comment section below. If you're interested in watching more videos from me, you can check out my end card where I'll have links to my most recent videos. I hope you all have a magnificent day, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!